Uh, I'm happy that we have this Davos. It's needed also. The team of Davos, this time fragmented world and how we can cooperate in that. We are dealing always in history with issues, but today we have quite a bit of issues, maybe even more than, than before. Of course, for Europeans, the war in the Ukraine is maybe the overriding issue. Connected to that, not totally, but connected to that, um, the energy problems, uh, the inflation connected to that. Uh, climate and climate and inflation is causing hunger in Africa. Hunger in Africa is causing immigration. So we're dealing with quite some uh, issues at this moment and therefore we need to collaborate. And we see that countries take in also their own position with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, mm -hmm. with India, made in India, or the protection things uh, happening in China or other Asian countries. So uh, we need to find ways to, uh, to collaborate. Is it your sense that the world is moving towards a more protectionist vibe? Well, we have been uh, moving very much on globalization and uh, one big village in the world. And I think people see that they are dependent on each other and do not always like that. And also, not everybody in the world benefited from globalization. If you take the United States, the middle part of the United States did not really benefit from globalization. The two coast areas uh, did. And then, of course, you get also political reactions to that, people uh, advocating uh, that group of voters. Um, so I think if we want to keep globalization as it is, we need to make it much more inclusive, inclusive for all. And if we leave our big groups of citizens, of consumers uh, from globalization, I think we get a counter reaction and that results to protectionism, rightly so, yeah. driven by the citizens. Mm -hmm. And that is not helpful addressing also all the issues we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. What is the best tool for more inclusivity though? I, mean, where does it, I, I understand it's a really broad question, but you, know, you think of uh, potential agreements on tax, for example, the, the second People are all for it, but then the second you go after a company and say you have to pay a windfall tax, or if you go after an individual and say you have to pay a wealth tax, then you meet resistance. Yeah, I, I would not Im immediately here advocate for more taxes, nor for corporations, nor for individuals. Although I think that everybody should pay its fair a part of the taxation. But, for example, if due to globalization you lose some businesses, take the middle part of the U.S., moving some businesses to China, you need to think carefully how you can replace that. Uh, from my former company, DSM, mm -hmm. when I was CEO, uh, we did that. Uh, we ever were a coal mining company, we stopped with all of that. Later on, chemical company, then a nutrition company. Uh, but every time when we made huge changes, which had a big impact for the province, uh, we thought, okay, what kind of new activities can we bring uh, there? Mm -hmm. And that is a private-public uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. The other topic I would like to mention, which is uh, heavily on the agenda here, is the whole area of sustainability yeah. and, and, and climate, of course. Mm -hmm. And we built in this Davos on what has happened, what happened in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt mm -hmm. during the COP27. The next COP is in the Middle East now. Um, companies are stepping up. We had a big meeting with 80 CEOs, part of the CEO Climate Leaders Alliance, yeah. who really want to step up. Yeah. They reduce emissions, they report more clear so that investors can choose which company is really future-proof. The element which is added in this Davos also is the area of adaptation, because everybody knows we will not mitigate totally. Um, we will reach maybe one and a half or more degrees Celsius. And the Africans also here are saying, well, we cost the least, we suffer the most, yeah. and we hope that you do care. Yeah. So we need to help them to adapt uh, at the same moment. And that means also opportunities for- and adapt as well. Exactly, yeah. mitigate and adaptation. Yeah. And for some businesses, seed companies, mm -hmm. and they can benefit, they can develop seeds which are better uh, in, in droughts areas and those yeah. kind of things. I mean, I guess the key word here is investment. So how do you ensure that private sector investments are actually going into the relevant technologies that are needed to come up with these adaptation solutions? Yeah, it's a very good point. And I, I'm a strong believer that technologies will help us. Technologies always helped us in the last 100, 200 years to develop ourselves. And there are a lot of new technologies. We can now take CO2 
out of the air and use it as raw materials. We have seeds which can grow in drought areas and all that stuff. So technologies can help. What we need to do with blended financing uh, tools uh, is to uh, deal with the risks. Because people say, yeah, but if we invest that in Africa or in Pakistan or Bangladesh or India, maybe it's more risky. And then they ask more uh, interest on, on, on the capital they provide. So we need to, to, to diminish that a little bit. Otherwise, only projects in the West uh, will benefit. But I think that is possible, and that is what we are discussing here in Davos, also with the investors and also with, um, and with companies and, of course, with countries. So you get private-public uh, relationships yeah. here. You mentioned the uh, Climate Alliance, did you say it was called? So, but with 80 multinationals, that's, that's a good number, but it's not a lot. It's not a lot. When do you get to critical mass? Well, in the Alliance, uh, I set it up uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it started with 30 multinational companies, uh, 80 were present at the meeting, it is 125 companies now with hundreds of thousands, a few hundred thousand suppliers and we pull the hundred thousand uh, suppliers into this uh, alliance also. But to your point, uh, it was funny, I was discussing with the COP president, uh, Minister Shukri uh -huh. of Egypt of course, and yeah. he was very much impressed. Uh, about 125, and he summarized at the end of my conversation, Mr. Sibus, 125,000 companies. I'm so impressed. <laughs> and I said, No, I meant 100,000. <laughs> I meant 125. So I agree. We need to mm. to grow the alliance, also yeah. with our suppliers and customers, uh, to have more impact. Mm. It's interesting. This group, if you take the group totally together, it will be the third largest country in terms of emissions. Mm. We don't want to remain the third largest country. We yeah. want to become one of the smaller countries yeah. in terms of emissions uh, yeah. altogether. We've committed ourselves to reporting, to reducing and to take action. Yeah. So I have to ask you about China. If you look at the CO2 emissions overall for 2022, they've gone up, but the largest offender was China on back of firing up coal plants again. So if we're all sitting here in Davos and all the Western world is coming together and saying, fine, we're going to set ourselves these targets and we're going to work on achieving those targets together, what good is that if China is not also doing their part? China has, a, I think, a double route. On one hand, you should give credits to China. The biggest windmill parks in, in the world are in China. The biggest solar parks in the world are China. So China is doing a lot on technology development, on changing its own uh, energy infrastructure. At the same moment, they're also still building new coal power plants um, and say, well, be careful of uh, committing our own reductions. On the other hand, for about 2,000 companies, mainly energy related, there is a carbon pricing in China, a modest carbon pricing of 5 or $6 dollars. In the United States, there is no carbon pricing, only in some states. So uh, I would like to be careful to say China is holding back, only mm. doing nothing. I think they are on a, on a dual track. I think they prepare totally for a low carbon future. And, and one day they will arrive there. Yeah. And I expect China at that moment to say everybody should have a low carbon economy when they have it. Yeah. When they still do not have it, they will be nuanced in their message. Mm. And I think the whole uh, challenge and debate is how do we uh, align, and that was the issue in Egypt, that's the issue now, mm. uh, United States, Europe, uh, and China uh, more. Mm. Here, the private sector can play a role because we feel from the investors behind us the pressure to future-proof our companies. The investors think long-term, and uh, they feel the world will change anyway, whether you like it or not. Mm. And we investors, and that was also clear on the meeting we had with 80 big companies, the investors say, we want you to future-proof, otherwise we want to be careful with our investment. Mm. That is a good driving force also for businesses. Mm. Do you think there's a geopolitical advantage to being ahead in this clean transition? What do you mean? Uh, in terms of, we spoke about China and its ambitions to eventually fully decarbonize. Do you think from an economic standpoint, does that put you at a relative oh, yeah, advantage? Oh, to oh absolutely true. And therefore, Europe with the European Green Deal, if you look to why Europe wants the European Green Deal, it's one to be net zero, uh, low carbon economy, etc. It's good for the environment. But the 
clear other reason uh, for Europe to do this is to develop all the technologies needed and to have a competitive advantage mm. at a certain moment, knowing the world will change anyway. It is inevitable. Uh, so, uh, and then those countries who have the technologies, those countries who have the companies who are fully, fully future-proof and have developed that, have a competitive advantage. Uh, it's difficult to assess that exactly. Is that the coming five years, 10 years, 15 years? But for people who think a little bit more longer term, this will happen anyway.